historical fiction by Larry J. Hilton is the topic on Zoom into books today. Welcome everyone. Larry Hilton is an avid student of history who has studied and traveled in Europe for more than 50 years. After retiring from the financial services industry, he penned his first book and now his second book, Streets of Tears, takes us to Vienna and the rise of Adolf Hitler. Larry is a former naval officer with experience in the Vietnam War. Thank you for your service, Larry, and welcome to Zoom Into Books. Thank Please. you. Happy to be here. You're quite welcome. We're happy to have you. And I'd like for you to start by telling us the story behind Streets of Tears. OK. Um, I was, I've been an investment advisor for 55 years. I retired a couple of years ago because I love my work. but. I'm really a history fan. I've been reading history since I started reading John Paul Jones in the eighth grade, and uh, it hasn't stopped. Uh, and I, uh, and the one thing that has really, really affected me in the last many years is the Holocaust and how that happened. And let's hope it never happens again. Um, but what is worrying me and why the motivation for writing the book is, uh, I keep hearing, now I'm, I'm here in Phoenix, Arizona, but I, you know, in reading all the reading that I do, I keep hearing that history is just not being taught in schools like it was in my day, like I feel it should be taught. And, and that really bothers me. And I just, I've got a 10 year old granddaughter. And when she's my age, is she gonna even have heard of the Holocaust? And I, the, I keep hearing these reports that I think that she may not even have heard of the Holocaust. And, and that really bothers me. Um, and so uh, I think the motivation uh, on the book, um, I'd really like to read just, it's real brief, my forward um, uh, on the book, because I think it's, a, it's real brief, but I think it, it is the essence of why I'm writing this book and why I think it is so important. Um, so The Streets of Tears is fiction and all the characters and adventures of the Bauer family are developed in the author's mind. However, the events from the horrors of trench warfare of World War I to the collapse of the Austrian government and the Anschluss with Nazi Germany are accurate. The words of the great personages in the story such as Voltaire, Marcus Aurelius and Friedrich Hayek are derived from their writings. No work of this size can be free of error, but it is hoped that the reader will see the events that led to the Holocaust as the shame of mankind. I believe those words very thoroughly. And, I, and that's why I, I, the events leading to the Holocaust. And what I mean by that is the the gas chambers, the, that, that to me uh, is the end result. But how did we get to that point? How did the German people get to that point? In other words, how does a German soldier walk up to a four-year-old girl that is of no threat to him whatsoever and shoot her in the head and then go home to his family? How do you do that? And that's what I'm trying to explore in, in, in the book. I, I was very fortunate when I was in college, a small college in Iowa um, in those days. Back in 1962, the school offered a study abroad program. Um, and I was, I'm no great academic, <laughs> probably more because my father could afford the trip, but I was selected to go. And I ended up in Vienna, Austria with a family there. Um, I, I don't speak German well or anything like that, but I love Austrian history and have studied it ever since. Um, my family, the family that I lived with over there, uh, became a big part of this book. Um, my father was a, um, his name was Victor Bauer. 
uh, this is the Victor Bauer in the book. He was a banker. Um, uh, I didn't see a lot of him. Uh, he was working and I'm, I'm in school. Um, but the mother I saw a lot and her name was Elsie Bauer, also my mother's name, first name. Um, I, I, like I said, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm no great academic. <laughs> um, I didn't have a lot of my uh, German history classes in the morning or uh, in the afternoon and, um, uh, and uh, Austrian history classes in the morning, in the afternoon. And then in the morning, I had German, uh, German language classes. Well, I don't speak German very well, and I would found out also that um, I was 20 years old, and you could drink in Europe at age 20. And I'd spend a lot of time in with with people, you know, in in restaurants and cafes and things like that in Vienna. And I and and Vienna was an interesting city in 1965. Uh, I'm sorry, 1962. Um, it was just recently out of um, the Russian uh, communism. Um, it had been, um, the city had been divided with the four powers uh, after World War II of France and England, uh, the US and Russia. Uh, and the Russians played a huge role in it at that time. Well, that, that effect was still there in 1962. And I was, um, and I'm a social, person and I got to know people and talking um, politics. Um, Nazism was still strong in those days. So you, you could meet a former Nazi in a bar, a, 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 a you know, communist um, and people from all over Europe. And it was just a wonderful education to me. And I, um, and well, as a result, I don't tell too much about myself, but, but I, I, I would, I learned so much and in, in just didn't drinking in bars with these people. And, and of course I'd miss my German language classes in the morning, but I would get up at about nine o'clock and my mother, uh, who would be there with a big breakfast for me. And she and I would sit at this big mahogany table that I describe in the book, and and she was just she was just wonderful to me, and uh, and I I just learned so much, uh, you know, in talking to her. Um, uh, they had a boy that was a little bit younger than me, a couple years younger than me, and his name was Fritz, and Fritz is in the book too. Um, but what it really accomplished was I, I was I'd go walking around Vienna. I got to know Vienna very very well. And this is 1962. It's it's not the same uh, Vienna that it is today. And I've been back to Vienna, you know, a couple of times and and, and fairly recently. And it's not the same city today as it was in 1962. But it was a wonderful experience that led me to this book. So anyway, now to to the book. And um, interrupt me if if there's any questions, but. But um, I, I start the story out with a, um, a young lady named El Elke Bauer. And um, she is um, uh, work she's a strong Nazi, um, loves Hitler, Adolf Hitler from day one. And, and she is her job, at, this is the end of the war, 1945, and the Russians are um, coming into Vienna. And, um, and they're a real threat. There's a lot of violence going on, things like that. And Elke is an attractive young lady. I think she's roughly 27, 28 years old at that time. And, um, and her job is, uh, is writing. She uh, writes about the German soldiers and what they're doing to holding off the, the Russian horde and um, you know, good um, stories like that to um, uh, you know, help the morale of the German soldier. Um, well, it finally gets to the point where she's got to get out. And uh, so her and her secretary uh, try to get to the American lines in uh, Munich. And, uh, and it's quite a ordeal, these two girls trying to get there with um, the whole Europe in a upheaval. It's not just, not just the Russians, also Austrians that were against Hitler. 
Uh, there weren't many, but there were some, and they're trying to get payback uh, from people like her that, um, that supported Hitler. Um, so anyway, just to go through that, uh, they, they, they get uh, uh, captured by the Americans. And, uh, and uh, so that we're um, now seeing what the Americans, uh, because she's still an unrepentant Nazi now. And uh, so she, they, uh, um, I bring in three American soldiers that interview her, and um, and actually these three guys are very similar to guys I spent in the Navy with in, during the Vietnam War, and um, and one of them wants to be a writer and uh, a historian, and he um, uh, he wants to understand where this love of Hitler and Nazism came from because uh, it makes no sense to him at all. Um, so in order to learn more, um, th there's a, um, a professor at the University of Vienna uh, that they want to interview, and he's, he's a Jewish man. And he, uh, so he sends one of his um, other officers to Vienna to interview this uh, gentleman, this professor. Um, and that's in you know, chapter three, where we, we learn a lot and we learn about uh, things that, uh, that um, uh, um, uh, the reason why um, the, uh, the Austrian people fell for, for this. I, I, I want to really bring that out. There's a chapter uh, where um, uh, that he, uh, uh, that, uh, that he explains where they came from, and it was so much of it was economics. Um, so then I take the, the um, after that, I take the story back to her father, who was now a, um, a soldier in the uh, German army. Um, and uh, he's uh, de in describing the last scenes of World War I, the trench warfare and the horrors of that. And you, you've got to understand, if you're going to understand why Hitler came about, it's things like this. The, um, the German soldier felt that they'd been stabbed in the back kind of thing, uh, where they weren't supported. They could, uh, they, they could have, you know, won the war, but except for um, the politics and the government that um, allowed them to be, like I said, stabbed in the back. The, um, um, so then you get into, right at the end of the war, I go into a chapter on her mother, um, um, Elsie Bauer. And uh, uh, Elkie, our kind of hero in the book, even though she becomes, um, she was born in 1918, right at the end of World War I. Um, so after the war, you have to understand the, um, the, um, uh, the hyperinflation that hit all of Germany and Austria at that time, uh, that um, how prices just went out of control. And I, I tell a story that's kind of humorous, but really not, that uh, the, um, a lady is going shopping um, for just milk and bread or something. And, um, and she's carrying a bushel basket full of the Austrian crowns or crones, they were called. Uh, bushel basket full of money. And uh, she's walking down the street and she spots something that catches her eye in a store window. And she puts the basket, the bushel basket down and goes into the store. She's only in the store a couple of minutes and she walks back out. The basket's gone, but the money's laying on the sidewalk. That means that all that money, the basket was worth more than all that money. Well, that's what people had to live with. And she was trying to figure out how to feed her, she meaning Elsie Bauer, how to feed this family of, there's two now, um, when money was worthless. And so a, a so chapter, Larry, yes. That, that is a most incredible story. <laughs> I yeah. mean, I get carried uh, away. You know, <laughs> we lived through inflation, but that, that really brings it to the forefront. We've never experienced anything like that.
Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, um, including myself, have never really understood, as you say, your heroine really admired uh, Hitler. And that's a concept that's really hard for uh, most of us to understand. Does the family not know about the Holocaust at the time? Did the people in Germany not, were they not aware of what was going on? Um, well, first of all, it's Austria we're talking about because uh, it's a separate country. It doesn't become Germany until uh, 1938. Um, and this is immediately after World War I, so we're talking about the 1920s. Um, sure. Uh, but, um, <laughs> well, as I get into the book, I start getting into the treatment of Jews. Um, there's a saying, I don't remember where I read this, but I, I firmly believe it, that the difference between Austria and Germany was strong. Um, the Germans were great Nazis, but lousy anti-Semites. The Austrians were lousy Nazis, but great anti-Semites. And that was from day one. And I get into that in several chapters about the treatment of Jews um, that um, was almost a daily occurrence, especially as the economy turned bad. It's all based on the economy, because after the hyperinflation, then you had the depression that set in in the 1930s and where people were out of jobs. And um, so many people just not working, even the ones that worked. Um, I, I do a chapter on Victor Bauer, the banker. He, he, he gets a job and, he, he's, and he's working, uh, but he's not making enough money to, uh, uh, to pay the bills. And, uh, but, you know, eventually he managed to get through it. And, um, and so you see it through his eyes. Uh, but um, uh, in so many cases, you know, people were just, they weren't working. And then when Hitler took over in, in Germany in 1932, the Austrian people were still struggling with the inflation and the, and the, uh, um, the, the, uh, the uh, de deflation and uh, and the whole um, economy that had collapsed. Um, so what would happen is the Austrian people would look across the border to Germany and they'd see Germany's doing well. Well, now but they didn't realize that they were making guns and tanks and airplanes, and that was every but everybody was working, and that's all they really saw was that, uh, that, uh, that, everybody, that every people, they're all working in Germany and here most of uh, the Austrian people are unemployed. Uh, so this Hitler guy must be doing something right. And, um, and so that, that, again, economics played a huge role in this um, that we have to understand. Um, so I, I hope I'm answering that question right, but. Uh, you, you did, economics drives everything for everyone. And it's interesting to hear this, this history that a lot of people, as you started out in the beginning, uh, we don't think that they are being taught now. Um, we have quite a few people watching with us on Facebook. Oh, We're okay. happy to have you join us. And if you have any questions for our author today, Larry J. Hilton, he is the author of Streets of Tears. Please type them in the comments and Larry will be happy to answer your questions. So um, we're talking about a family in Vienna and um, Larry, you were just starting to tell us about, we've talked about the economy. So uh, continue with your story, please. Okay. Um... As I said in my foreword there that uh, uh, I bring in three real people uh, and I use their writings, um, uh, Voltaire and uh, uh, Friedrich Hayek and uh, Marcus Aurelius. Um, but I, there's one scene in the book when Elke is um, considering killing herself. She's been released by the American army, but has no money and no place to go except back to Vienna 
Uh, her parents were killed or died in the war. Um, I get into that later in the book. I'm not going to get into it now. So all she has is the home on Darngargasa. Again, this is the home I lived in uh, for uh, for four or five months. Um, so I, I couldn't describe it very well. So that's all she's got. Uh, she's no hopes of a job. Um, and uh, so she's thinking of killing herself, that there's absolutely no future left. And uh, I, 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 I uh, describe um, downtown Vienna, a um, city that I knew very well, uh, especially in 1962. Um, and uh, so I describe that. Well, I am her ending up in the National Library um, in downtown Vienna. And by the way, it's one of the most beautiful libraries I've ever been in my life. And uh, I just love the place. Um, and like I said, she's thinking of killing herself and she just starts, you know, picking out a book or two here or there. And she ends up with the economist Friedrich Hayek, who most people don't know who he is, but uh, as an economist or a semi-economist that I am, uh, I'm a huge fan of Friedrich Hayek. And like I said, she's thinking of killing herself and she opens her book and she's looking through, kind of paging through his book a little bit. And she comes across this paragraph that I'm going to read to you because I think it really helped. It's not even a paragraph, it's just a few words, a uh, sentence. Um, uh, he says that, um, I will leave you with this, Hayek replied. What our generation has forgotten is the system, and remember this is written in 1932, uh, system of private property is the most important guarantee of freedom not only for those who own property, but scarcely less for those who do not. It is only because the control of the means of production is divided among many people acting independently that nobody has complete control over us. If all the means of production are vested in a single hand, whether it be that of society as a whole or that of a dictator, whoever exercises this control has complete control over us. And, and uh, that meant a lot to her at that time. And I think it kind of led her to believe that, uh, that maybe it was worth it. And then she, she met um, uh, she, one other book that she came up with, and now I can't find what I'm looking for, but it was Voltaire. And I'm, I'm a big fan of Voltaire. And the, she, she's paging through the, the book on Voltaire, and she comes across kind of a famous line of his, but it says to cultivate your garden. In other words, what that meant is you can be yourself. You can bring yourself out of this, if, but you've got to do the work to do it. And that, those words meant a lot to her. And as you'll see in the book, that she, she takes those words at heart, and she does start to pull up, but it's a long, slow process. <laughs> and uh, that, the big part of that is, is a, a long, slow process. So, but, um, so. So um, I know that you have another book, which is nonfiction. Um, mm. And so how do you feel this book is different from other books? About well, my first book was, um, I, I was working at the time, and Europe was um, uh, uh, was trying to become um, uh, independent, and uh, where the, the European bloc was becoming a uh, some kind of a unifying unifying unification. Um, and I, I was working at that time, and I was very I'm, I'm very uh, I, I love Europe very much, and I was trying to. Uh, tell them what to do. <laughs> and I thought that what Europe needed to do was to do what, uh, what we've done here. And I, because I think this country is doing it right. And that you have one president or one prime minister, one uh, uh, parliament and one federal reserve and one judiciary uh, for all the, you know, 19, I think at that time it was 19 countries. Um, Europe didn't uh, <laughs> didn't listen to me, of course, but I I enjoyed writing the book and uh, and uh, again I even that book I kind of concentrate on Vienna a little bit um, because I know it well and 
Oh, it, you know, it sold it a little bit, uh, but it was an experiment for me. And I, it turned out that I, I'm better at writing a novel, a uh, historical-based novel. Um, uh, you know, two of my favorite writers, uh, the, the novel that I've looked at the most, probably, obviously, Tolstoy. Uh, I love War and Peace. Uh, I, I read it several times. And... Uh, and then another one is um, uh, The Winds of War by uh, um, oh, uh, uh, Herman Wong, Herman Wong. And um, I, I, I think where those two write about a, a difficult subject like war, but they bring it to individuals. Uh, they put you, the individual, in that situation. And, um, uh, and and that made sense to me. In fact, I had a, um, uh, when The Winds of War came out, uh, Herman Wong's book was an extremely popular book, back in the 70s, I believe, if I'm right there. And uh, a good friend of mine, um, uh, probably my best friend, uh, never read a book in his life <laughs> other than college. And uh, other than maybe the sports page or a sports book or something. But, uh, I, and one day he calls me up and he said, Larry, I'm, I'm reading this tremendous book. I thought, what? Carl, read a book? <laughs> and he was reading The Winds of War. And I, it stuck in the back of my mind that maybe what, you know, a historian, and I'm not a historian, but uh, has to do is make it interesting. And so what I've tried to do here is with, based with my experience in Vienna and, and the people I knew in Vienna, bring them into the story to make it real, uh, to make the reader feel like you're there. Um, you know, the Russians are coming in and the Russians are, are, are you know, uh, doing horrible things to people as they come into Vienna. Well, what was that like? And uh, so I think being a historical novel, you can do that. Yeah, uh, I don't get into, um, other than the people that I've quoted, um, I, I don't really get, yes, Hitler's mentioned, uh, but only as you would mention him if you lived there at that time. So uh, uh, I, I, I think you're... I think, question, I think uh, the, the historical novel is what I really like to write. And I'm, in fact, I'm writing in a third one now. Um, just Good. Kidding. That's great. Well, um, I, 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 I'm so attracted to Vienna in those days. And I wanted to bring Sigmund Freud into the whole story. And uh, so that's what I'm doing now with uh, the, the, my latest book. But it, it's at least a year away. But uh, I, I, it was interesting. Uh, Sigmund Freud, uh, you know, a very popular person, but a Jew. And how you asked the question about uh, the, the Austrian people or the Viennese people, they were, they were Jew haters from day one. And uh, they were educated people. This is, you know, Vienna, Austria, you know, one of the great universities of the world, especially at that time, was the, uh, the Vienna, um, the University of Vienna. It was one of the great universities. But yet, anti-Semitism in, in, in Vienna was just, it was awful. And uh, Sigmund Freud uh, trying to get out of there is the, when the Germans came in. It's a, it's a fascinating story. And so I'm trying to write that now. <laughs> well, I think you've really hit on something that um, I agree. I think historical fiction reaches many more people than sitting in a history class, unfortunately. <laughs> um, a diary, the Diary of Anne Frank did that for so many people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, for um, colonial times, for me, it was the John Jake series, the Bicentennial series. Mm -hmm. um, when you can fictionalize uh, historical events and it puts the reader into the story, that's where your success is, I'm sure. Absolutely. And um, you were saying your third book's going to incorporate Sigmund Freud. Uh -huh. That's terrific. <laughs> so, yes, 
uh, how he got out of Vienna is just an amazing story. It's uh, a sequel to this one. Yeah, it's a it's a sequel. I'm 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 bringing in okay. the same people. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, good. That's good. Oh yeah, no. Absolutely. Uh, our family will be in it again because uh, uh, in order to bring Sigmund Freud into it, I have to you know go back in time. Um, uh, at the end of the book, and I don't want to give this away, but at the end of the book, Elke, um, you tell um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> needs psychiatric help. Yeah, uh, Elsie goes pretty much insane. Because um, remember, she's lived her life as a follower of Hitler and a lover of Hitler and Nazism. And when the truth finally hits her, it hits her hard. And uh, she, she goes, um, in, into a bit of you know hysteria and so i when i thought of that i thought well let's bring sigmund freud in into this uh sequel so uh, it sounds it yeah. sounds absolutely yeah. fascinating um for those of you who have joined us we're talking with larry j hilton the author of streets of tears um you can get this book on amazon and um, Larry, I know we, we always have first time authors, new authors watching Zoom into books. So how about telling us what you have learned from the publishing process of your journey? <laughs> well, the biggest thing I've learned, uh, Kathy, is you need a really good editor. <laughs> and uh, I didn't really, I had a real good editor on my first book that I, and I just assumed it was going to be simple. Um, unfortunately, she, she'd gotten older and didn't want to do the second book. And, um, uh, and so I kind of drifted along with my own editing and some, you know, a few others and things like that. But when the book came out and, uh, and I, I, and actually this was about a year ago and I, I um, had about oh, 30 or 40 copies printed just to give out to people that I knew would be honest with me and uh, give me, you know, this, this is a good story or not a good story or whatever. And um, not all friends, I mean, people that I knew would be honest. And, uh, and it came back, they loved the story. They thought this was an outstanding story, but the book needed more editing. <laughs> and uh, remember, I'm a finance guy. I'm not a writer. I'm trying to become a writer. Um, and uh, But fortunately, through uh, Beth uh, and Rhonda, uh, I, uh, uh, I, we got some really good editing done. So the book uh, uh, has been delayed in getting out because we both feel that the book is good enough. We want this uh, almost as perfect as we can make it. So uh, thanks to people like Beth and Rhonda, um, we've, I think we've accomplished that. And so now I'm anxious to come out and talk about the book. Um, um, you know, I've never done this before, so <laughs> I was a little nervous, but. Well, uh, you're you're doing a great job. And um, Larry's talking about Beth Calm and Warner from Author Connections. Um, she has a great service for authors and we'll put her link in the Facebook chat too. Um, Larry, I'm sure that you're such a great storyteller that um, you would, you do speaking engagements, you would speak to groups and um, oh, better. Yeah. How can people get in touch with you to do that? Um, well, I, I guess my email address. Uh, on the iCloud, maybe? On the on iCloud, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I'm talking to my wife here. She knows this kind of stuff better than I do. So. Oh, I yes, your, your iCloud address would be the best one. Okay. Um, that's Larry underscore Hilton. Hilton, H-I-L-T-O-N, at iCloud. At I, at iCloud. Okay. okay, and I'm posting that in the comments now for any uh, book clubs, librarians, mm -hmm. schools, high schools, colleges, veterans groups, um, historical groups that would like to get in touch with Larry. Um, I know you said your book's not been out very long, but I always ask this of everybody who comes on to Zoom into books. 
so far. What is your most memorable author moment with your book? Um, boy, that's a good question. Author uh, experience. I know because of COVID, um, a lot of the authors haven't been able to get out, meet people, you mm -hmm. know, do events. But uh, when you're thinking about your most memorable author experience, what's the first thing that comes to mind? I, the first thing that comes to mind, I think, is um, when I first sent the book out, uh, I finished it and sent it out to these people, um, there were several that I didn't even think liked me. <laughs> and I'm exaggerating there. But, but, and they just came back just raving about the book. Uh, they admitted there were some editorial problems um, that needed to be corrected, but the story itself, and I think that's what really I was trying to do more than anything, uh, is get the word out there that, that um, what, what Nazism was really about, uh, it wasn't about the Holocaust. Um, and, and, you know, like you mentioned at the beginning of this, um, that to me, history is, is when, when it's being taught, it's about the Holocaust. It's not the Holocaust. The Holocaust to me, and I've never really gotten into it, the Holocaust was what I like to call, and it's not probably not the best term, but clean killing. In other words, they would herd three, four hundred people into a big room and drop cyanide pills and people died. That to me is not what I was interested in. What I was interested in, like I said earlier, how does a German soldier walk up to a four-year-old little girl, Jewish. shoot her in the head, and then go home to his family? And that's the part I've never understood. And when I've really gotten into the history of Nazism, and this is, you know, before, now it's mostly Austrian history, but, um, but like I said, um, Austria was even worse than Germany as far as their anti-Semitism. And, and so this was going on long before Hitler came into power in Austria. Um, and I've got lots of stories that I tell about things that were just horrible things that were happening uh, to Jewish people and, and not, you know, Jewish little children, uh, just horrible things um, that uh, even before, you know, Austria or Vienna was taken over, there's all kinds of stories in my book about just people walking along a sidewalk and a bunch of thugs coming up and beating the heck out of them and maybe killing them. Um, I mean, the stories, you know, my father was a merchant, uh, had it, ran a store at a little town in Iowa. And I've, I tell stories about how um, parents would take their children to the nearest candy store that was Jewish owned. And the kids would go in and take all the candy they wanted and everything, the parents would go in and then just walk out, not bothering to pay for it. Uh, and uh, that was going on long before Hitler. Uh, so I don't, I don't think most people, particularly in the US, even knew that. No. Uh, and no. So do you think with the research that you've done so far, do you think you've found the answer to your question? <laughs> oh, I wish I could say that I have faith in humankind, but I, I don't know. I, I just, all I can do is um, hope this book gets out to people and so that people understand what really happened and that it happened long before the Holocaust. Um, and that's really all I can do. I, I um, you know, in America, we have, you know, the freedoms that even the rest of the world today does not have. And, and those freedoms are important. Um, what Frederick Hayek wrote there that I was reading to you, I, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in that. Um, uh, so, uh, that, you know, I, I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but, um, I, I, I wish I had more faith, but 
<laughs> I don't know that I do. But I'm well, sure to be living in America rather than Europe, as much as I love Europe. And, uh, and I, I spent, <laughs> when I retired from you know, my work as investment advisor, uh, I, I got an opportunity and I was 78 years old, 77, 77 or 78 years old. I got an opportunity to go study um, uh, history at uh, Oxford in England and my wife and I, and uh, my wife's much smarter than I am. She only took one class. I took three classes and uh, it really did a real job on me uh, health wise, but uh, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, but I wouldn't live in England for anything. Uh, I, uh, so, no, there's nothing greater than this country. Uh, and I wish Europe had taken my advice. I really do. Uh, I think they would be. Much I agree. Today. Yeah. I agree. And I think I think one way to get your message out is through writing these wonderful books. And I'm so glad to hear that you have a sequel. Um, do, do you have an idea when the sequel will be oh, forthcoming? Uh, will it be 2022? <laughs> no, I, Kathy, I don't know. Um, all I can do is, because I want it quality, uh, it'll need a lot of editing. I'm not an editor. I'm a writer, not an editor. And, well, it sounds uh, like you have a good team with you. I, so I have a wonderful Maybe with their help. Larry, I want to thank you so much for coming on Zoom Into Books. I think you have a very important message and I hope that people will watch this video. If you joined us late, you can watch the entire video on the Zoom Into Books Facebook page. And in the coming weeks, it'll be on the Zoom Into Books YouTube channel and you can watch it there and share it with your friends too. And I'm sure Larry will be checking the comments. So if you have additional questions, just go ahead and type them in the Facebook page comments and he'll check back periodically and be happy to answer those. So we want to thank Larry. Thank you, Beth at Author Connections. And Larry, I wish you the best on your new book. Thank you, Kathy. Thank, thank you. Very much. you.